Okay, um, this is a video to demonstrate um, the process of DNA replication. It is suitable for students, uh, undergraduate uh, biology majors in their first semester, sort of like an intro to biology course. And um, so we're going to go over the structural elements, uh, the enzymes that are involved, that sort of thing. So we're going to start uh, by building a legend and we're going to keep a list of the different enzymes and structures that are involved. So for our DNA, our old DNA, that's going to be listed in black. Sorry, there we go. We are also going to have some pieces of RNA that's going to be labeled in red. We're also going to have new DNA. And then we're going to have a list or a series of enzymes or proteins that are going to be involved in this process. Okay, so as you know, DNA is usually represented as a double-stranded molecule. So we're going to have a section here of double-stranded DNA. And this double-stranded DNA is eventually going to be opened up into what's called a replication bubble at some point in order to facilitate replication. And so this bubble is really big, but at one on one half of it, on the left half of it, for example, is what's called a replication fork, and that's what we're drawing here. So as you know, DNA is a um, anti-parallel and complementary molecule. So our top strand, we're just going to go ahead and label as five prime to three prime. Because it's anti-parallel, that means that this bottom strand has to be three prime to five prime. Um, and so we've unwound this DNA, and the reason that happens is because of an enzyme that is called helicase. Our enzymes are going to be drawn in, um, let's see, we'll draw it in a purple color. So helicase, we're going to draw as sort of this donut that happens here. We're going to call this helicase. And we're going to list that here with our list of proteins and structures. So proteins will be labeled, or enzymes will be in purple, and we'll use another color for our structural elements. Okay, so helicase is going to unwind and uh, take that DNA from double-stranded to a single-stranded uh, morphology. Um, upstream of, whoops, sorry, upstream of the replication fork, this helicase action is going to generate a lot of tension in our double-stranded DNA. Um, if you've ever tried to unknot a wheel, unwieldy mess of yarn, you'll know that eventually you can start sort of unwinding it, but that's going to generate a lot of tension ahead of where your knot is located. So we have another enzyme that I'm going to depict uh, sort of as this oval shape. And this, I'm going to color it in to make it a little more visible, is called topoisomerase. Topoisomerase, what it's going to do is go ahead of the replication fork and um, identify those areas of tension. It's going to break the phosphodiester bonds um, that form between the sugars and the phosphates. Um, and it's going to untwist um, that DNA and then rejoin the ends that it's just separated back into a covalently bound uh, phosphodiester bond um, to relieve that tension that's ahead of the fork. So remember that we've now generated a single-stranded um, uh, mode for our DNA here. And in order to maintain that, we want to use a um, protein that, let's see, what color haven't I used yet? We will use our blue in this case. Um, so blue is going to be um, just structural elements or proteins um, that are involved. And we're going to build these things that are called single-stranded binding proteins. Um, I'm going to label them as SSBs. And what they are is effectively like molecular paperweights. They keep these single-stranded uh, DNA strands from um, reannealing or rejoining to make a double-stranded molecule. So they keep the fork open. Okay, we're just about ready to start making some DNA. Um, as you remember, uh, DNA, or you may or may not remember, DNA is always going to be made in a five prime to three prime direction. So that means we have to start at a three prime end. 
there's going to be a protein that's going to kick this whole thing off. It is called, or an enzyme, it's called primase. And it's gonna add RNA primers. So primase will go ahead and label with, um, so if helicase was a donut shape and topoisomerase was this oval, then we're gonna label primase as a diamond. And primase, we're gonna label it with a P, um, is gonna come in here and lay down some RNA primers. That RNA thing is really important. Um, you're probably thinking, we're making DNA, why are you adding RNA? Um, and R this RNA is going to be made in a complementary and anti-parallel fashion to the original DNA strand. But we have to do this because DNA polymerase, which is the next enzyme that's involved, it can't make DNA from scratch. It has to build off of something that's already there. And so for that reason, um, we're going to have to um, generate this primer that's going to generate this three prime hydroxyl group right here. And that basically gives um, an open end for DNA polymerase to extend from. So our uh, DNA polymerase, we're going to call it, uh, we're, it's uh, called 3, but we're going to just go ahead and abbreviate DNA pol 3. And this is going to be a circle. Um, so like this. DNA polymerase 3 is going to come in here and recognize this 3' prime hydroxyl group and it's gonna start laying down DNA from this three prime end. So it's bound right here, and it's gonna keep going as far as it can until it runs into the fork. And in fact, it's ever, it never actually going to catch up to the fork because the fork is always opening more and more and more. So it's going to keep going, keep going, keep going. Um, and of course, this continues all the way down here. So um, the situation gets a little bit more complicated on the bottom strand. Um, for physical reasons, really, because remember, we have to generate in a five prime to three prime direction, which means that we have to start on th at the three prime end of a molecule. Well, this is as three prime end as we get right now because this, the fork is closed and an opening at this point. So we could start our primer here and go, but the thing is this, this uh, fork is opening more and more all the time. So we will be doing that. We will go ahead and put a, a primer down uh, right here as close as we can, but it's going to open and expand later on. So that means that we're gonna to have to continually add new RNA primers. And so the way that this ultimately looks as we progress down the fork is we're going to have this situation where um, we build new DNA and then the fork opens a little more and then we have to um, generate another primer, which is gonna be done by primase once again. Um, and we're gonna get these sort of starts and stutters for our um, DNA molecule at this point. So here's another primer. Um, and so on. Right up until this replication fork, and then it's just gonna have to wait for a second for this fork to open up a little bit more. Okay, so you can tell right away that things look a little different from the top strand versus the bottom strand. We have these stops and stutters. And so this takes us to our second structural element that I want to talk about today. Um, you see how this is all one continuous strand and it is following helicase as it goes down the fork? We call this the leading strand. And that really has more to do, not necessarily that it happens first, but that it's happening in a continuous manner. We're going to call this strand down here that has the stops and starts our lagging strand. This doesn't mean that it is a slower process necessarily, it just means um, that it is encumbered by this stop and start process. The second thing I want to highlight here is these fragments of DNA that we see here and how they stop and stutter. These stutters are called Okazaki fragments after the people, it's a husband and wife pair that discovered them. So that's what those are called. But as you know, or may know, um, DNA is exclusively a DNA molecule at the end. We don't have any RNA embedded in there. So we're gonna have to take out that RNA um, and replace it with DNA. Um, to do that, we're going to need another enzyme that is called DNA polymerase 1. 
And remember how I said it has to have a three prime hydroxyl group to work off of? Well, good news. Each one of these fragments at the end of it has a three prime hydroxyl group. So we have something for DNA polymerase to extend from. So DNA polymerase one, which is also going to be a circle, but it's gonna have a one inside of it. Um, so let's have that come in right here. It is going to come find this hydroxyl group and um, it's going to start laying down new DNA in place of that RNA. It's gonna extend right from here and replace this RNA primer. Same thing is gonna happen here. So now our um, DNA polymerase one is gonna to come to this primer and it's gonna find the three, hy pr three prime hydroxyl group here and generate uh, DNA here in the place of the RNA that was there previously. There is now a little gap or what's called a nick um, in between this new DNA strand and the five prime end of the strand that had been made just a moment before um, because um, it, the DNA polymerase doesn't quite know what to do with a three prime end and the five prime end of a molecule that's already been bound to a single strand of DNA. So we're going to have to get another enzyme involved here. Um, and it's going to be called DNA ligase. Uh, we will depict this as a square. So DNA um, ligase, we're going to label with an L, is going to come in here, swoop in here, find those nicks, and fill them in. It basically serves to glue that phosphodiester bond back together joining the five prime and three prime ends of these fragments. So eventually we do come to a place where we have a contiguous um, DNA molecule all the way throughout with no RNA um, there whatsoever. Um, I believe that is all that I needed to say about um, DNA replication. Um, and thank you very much for watching.